In this video, we are going to take a look at sets. This is the first of two slides that overview uh, the sets and what we will cover in this video. Often I try to cram everything into one slide, but this one I put in a few examples and also many of the concepts of sets you'll be familiar with, so it won't be as much as it might look at first. This is the second slide. Oh, also it took some space because I had these Venn diagrams, which you've probably seen before. But we will go over all these things. We will start with the definition of a set. A set is a collection of objects characterized by some defining property that allows us to think of the objects as a whole. The objects in the set are called elements or members of the set, and it is customary to use capital letters to designate sets and lowercase to designate the elements or members of the set. So A is a member of set, of set A, can be written with this epsilon, and epsilon means is a member of. So element A is a member of set A. To define a set, we can either list the elements, so A, and we use these curly brackets, has the members 1, 2, 3, 4, or we can use a defining rule, such as C is equal to X, such that X is a prime, or you can uh, denote that as C is the set of all X such that X is prime. And a set order does not matter. So 1, 2, 3, 4 is equal to 2, 3, 1, 4 is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 4. So repeated elements also do not matter. And we have the designations for some special sets. So the Z positive, capital Z with the plus sign, is a set of all positive integers, whereas Z by itself is the set of all integers Q is a set of all rational numbers, in other words, numbers that can be expressed as an integer n divided by an integer p, and R is the set of all real numbers. Um, they're all bolded. Um, here, the interval from A to B, including the endpoints, is the closed interval, and we define it here. The defining rule is x is a real number such that x is greater than or equal to A and less than or equal to B. Here we have the parentheses, AB is the open interval, and that's defined as X in R such that, or X is a real number, such that X is strictly greater than A and strictly less than B. And then we have the half uh, open, half closed interval, where if we have the uh, parentheses on the B, then X can now be, um, is, is still strictly less than B, but for the bracket, X can be greater than or equal to A. And this is the other half bracket on the A, so now X is strictly greater than A, but it can be less than or equal to B. I am guessing a lot of this is already familiar to you. Our next definition is of subset. So if A and B are sets, we say A is a subset of B, or we can also say A is contained in B, if every element of A is an element of B. And we denote that with this uh, contained, like a C with a line under it. So it's contained or equal to. So A is a subset of B. If A is a subset of B and there exists an element of B that is not an A, then A is a proper subset of B. In other words, A is strictly contained in B. It is not equal to B. Written in symbols, A is contained in B if x is an A implies x is in B. And so one thing about this portion of mathematics, when you're doing a lot of proofs, definitions are everything. It's one of the things that allow you to do proofs. So you really need to know the definition. So this has to be memorized. It's not enough to have a general sense of what a subset is or a working intuition of a subset. You actually have to know this definition because when you want to show that A is a subset of B, this definition tells you what you need to show. You need to show if X is an A, then X is in B. So in other words, you start out by assuming if I have an element X in A, you need to prove that X is necessarily also in B. So this definition tells you exactly what you need to show in order for A to be contained in B. So our next definition, let A and B be sets. We say A is equal to B if A equals B if A is contained in B and B is contained in A. 
So this is the definition you're going to use for equality, for sets being equal. And again, you might have an intuitive notion of what it means to have two sets be equal, but if you want to show two sets are equal, you need to show two things. A is contained in B and B is contained in A. You have to show, if you want to show equality, that the two sets satisfy the definition, which is why you have to memorize these definitions. So we'll do some examples. We have A is the set with numbers 1, 3, B is the set with numbers 3, 5, C is the set 1, 3, 5, D are uh, the real numbers such that x squared minus 8x is, e uh, I think this might be a minus 15 equals 0. And the following statements are true. Here I was looking at D and I took this uh, equation and I factored and saw for D is equal to 3, D or D is equal to 5. So D has two elements, 3 and 5. We'll start with the first um, statement. A is a subset of C. So A is contained in C if, and by definition, we're going to use this definition here, if X in A implies X is in C. So we just replaced B with C because this is what we're trying to show. Well, A has two elements. So if X is an element of A, A has two elements, the elements 1 and 3. So these, this first element is also in C, so that's good. And we also have 3 is also in C. If we look here, we have 1 and 3. So these two elements in A are also in C. So therefore, the conditions have been met and A is contained in C. Our next statement, A is not contained in B. So this line through it means it's not contained in B. So to see that, if A were contained in B, that would imply that every element X in A is also an element of B. So if we look at um, 1, that's an element of A, but you can see that 1 is not an element of B. So this condition is not met, so A is not contained in B. Next, I took these three statements. Uh, 5 is an element of B, 5 is contained in B, and the set containing 5 is contained in B. So the first one, 5 is an element of B. That is certainly true. You can see 5 right here is an element of B. The next statement, 5, is contained in B. So when we talk about subsets or containment, we talk about sets. So A and B, we start off with the definition of being a subset. We start off with A and B are sets. In this case, 5 is not a set. It is just an element. However, if you put the brackets around it, now you have the set containing the element 5. So this set contains one element, it is 5, and it is definitely contained in B because every element, if um, X is in our set containing 5, implies that X is in B. And that is true because we have one member is an element of our set containing 5, and we also have 5 is an element of B. So this statement here is true. So these brackets here make all the difference because this makes this a set, whereas this is just a number, a real number. The next statement, 1 is an element of D, or is not an element of D, and that is true because D only has two elements, 3 and 5. The uh, next statement, B is equal to D, so this might seem really obvious once you have these two written out that they're equal, but formally, sometimes uh, your sets may de be denoted in a different way, like um, it might be an infinite set, for example, so you don't have the entire list, so you have to go through this formal way of showing that they are equal. So we're going to use this with this trivial example, and there'll be harder examples later. But um, to prove that B is equal to D, we need to use the definition, which means that B is contained in D and D is contained in B. So we have two things to show, two conditions to satisfy to show equality. The first one, B is contained in D, again using our definition of subset, if X is in B implies X is in D. Well, X and B, there are two elements that satisfy that, 3 and 5, and we can see that those two elements are also in D. So this condition is satisfied. And then our second condition, D is contained in B. So if X is in D, then X is in B. D contains two elements, 3 and 5, 
and they are also contained in B. So the second condition is satisfied and B equals D. Again, this is a trivial example, but um, there will be harder ones later, but you want to get used to seeing how to use these formal definitions. Our last statement is that B is not equal to C. To show that, well, let's look at the definition of B equals C. So the con two conditions we have to meet is that B is a subset of C and C is a subset of B. But we can see that C is not a subset of B because we have this element 1 that is in C, but 1 is not in B. So this, um, because of this, the element 1, oh, this should be a not, uh, we do not meet the condition that C is a subset of B, and therefore B cannot equal to C. Again, you probably knew this intuitively, but you want to get used to using the formal definitions. Now that we've defined uh, subsets and also set equality, we can talk about construction of new sets from old sets. In particular, if we have A and B, we can define the union, the intersection, and the complement. So A union B are all the elements such that X is in A or X is in B. In other words, everything in A and everything in B combined together is the union. The intersection with this upside down U is everything in X and everything in B. So it's the things that A and B have in common. That's the intersection. A relative complement of B, that is everything in A minus what it has in common with B. So in other words, X is in A and X is not in B, so what's left? So our next example is another proof. Let A and B be subsets of a, of a universal set. So U is kind of like the universe, whatever numbers or whatever elements you have. Then you want to prove that A intersect U relative complement of B is equal to A relative complement of B. So to show this, that A intersect U relative complement of B is equal to A relative complement of B, I need to show two things. Using my definition of equality, I need to show that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side. So that's the statement here. And I need to show that the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side. So that's what I have written over here. So there are two things I need to show. I will start with the first statement. So to show that A intersect U relative complement of B is a subset of A relative complement of B, I use my definition of subset. I need to show that any X on the left-hand side implies that that element X is also an element of the right-hand side. And again, that's just the definition of what it means to be contained. If X is on the left-hand side, it's also an element of the right-hand side. I'm going to start my proof with letting x be an element of my uh, left-hand side. And this is how all proofs of containment start. So you always start by saying, let x be an element of the subset. And then you want to show that it's also an element of the superset. So this is always how you want to start. So this is something you should write down and make note of. And I'm just going to use my definition of union here and, and say that since X is in the union, that must mean X is in each of the individual sets individually. So X is an element of A and X is an element of U uh, contained in B. And then I'm just going to remind myself what is it that I need to show that X is an element of A uh, with the uh, relative complement of B. So this example is going to hopefully convince you that it's helpful when you want to say, okay, this is what I want to prove, and you want to say, well, I need to show, and you say what you need to show, because that way, once you're in the middle of the proof, you can compare where you're at to what you need to show. So this is going to be super helpful because if you look at this, let's remind ourselves, we started with let X be in A intersect B, right? Um, uh, A intersect U relative complement of B. And we wanted to show that X is in A relative complement of B. And if I look at the definition of A relative complement of B, that means that X is in A and X is not in B. 
but I can look and compare that now to what it is I need to show. And I see that X is in A, I have that part. All I need is to show that X is not in B, but I can now use this part here to show that X is not in B and I'll be done. So let's see how that works. But again, this example should convince you that it's really helpful to write what it is that you're trying to show so that along the way you can kind of compare and see where you're at and try to figure out how you're going to bridge between these two. As I said now, to show that X is not in B, I'm going to use the fact that X is in the relative complement of U uh, with B. So X in U relative complement of B by definition means that X is in U and X is not in B. So now I have the two things, exactly what I want to show. So to finish this off, I'm going to say I have X in A and I have X not in B, which means that X is in A relative complement of B. So I am done with part one of my proof. So part two, and I put a little two over here, and my proof is to show that A relative complement of B is contained in A intersect U relative complement of B here. So I need to show this. And again, I'm going to write uh, what that means, what I need to show. And using my definition of this containment, this subset, I want to show that if x is an element of what's on the left-hand side, then x must necessarily be an element of what's on the right-hand side. And I am going to start this proof by saying let x be a member of the subset, so a relative complement of b. And again, as I said in, uh, before, all containment proofs start like this. You have let x be an element of the subset. And they end with x is an element of the superset. And I rewrite this using my definition of the complement. That's uh, the same thing as saying x is in A and x is not in B. And again, like the other example, I'm going to compare where I'm at with what it is I want to show. And looking the, at this, if x is an element of A intersect, U relative complement of B, that means X is in A and X is in U relative complement of B, which means X is in A, and then looking at the definition of relative complement of B, that means X is in U and X is not in B. So I'm going to compare that with where I'm at. And the reason why this is a good time to do this comparison is because there's nothing else to break down, right? So there's really not a lot of place to go from here. You can't break anything down further. So we're just going to do that comparison. Let's see. So we have X is in A. We have X is not in B. And then uh, since U is the universal set containing both A and B, we automatically have X and U. So let me write this down and finish off the proof. So here I have X is in A. I also have X is in U. By definition of the universal set, and I know I didn't talk about that a lot, so I'm going to tell you now. The universal set is the universe of, that you're considering. So it contains everything. So X is in U by default, because U is the universal set. And then we also have that X is not in B. And so we have everything we need. We can group these together and say that is the definition. X is in U and X is not in B is the definition of X is in uh, U, U relative complement of B. So now X is in A and X is in U relative complement of B. So they are in the inter X is in the intersection of A and U relative complement of B. And I am done because I have shown both uh, the two conditions, one and two. I've proven both are true, and so then I have shown equality. Next, we're going to prove theorem uh, 2.113, and we're going to show uh, part D, which is here. A union B intersect C is equal to A union B intersect A union C. Because we're showing inequality, by definition of equality, we have two things to show. We need to show that this here on the left-hand side is a subset of what's on the right-hand side, and vice versa. What's on the right-hand side is a subset of what's on the left-hand side. And to show part one that uh, this is a subset of this, we need to show if x is an element of what's on the left-hand side, then x must be an element of what's on the right-hand side. And we start, like all of our proofs of containment, let x be in whatever is on the left-hand side. And by definition of union, if x is in a union, then x must be an A, or 
because it's union, x must be and b intersect c. And this is my favorite part of this proof. Because of the intersection, there's this or. You can break this down into two cases, that x is equal to a or x is not equal to a. And you can show in both of these cases um, that you know, what you're trying to show is true. So again, because of this or, to me, that suggests cases on a. So we'll start with the case if x is equal to a. So we're going to assume x is in a, and um, there's not much place to go from here, so I'm going to look at what it is that I need to show. So again, it's really handy to say what it is you need to show. You're trying to show that x is in a union b intersect a union c. But actually, if you think about that, if x is in a, then x is in the union of a with anything. So let's start there. So if x is in a, that means x is in a union b, and x is also in a union c, by definition of union. If x is in a, then x is in a union anything, any set. What we've shown is that if x is an element of a, then a union b intersect c is a subset of a union b intersected with a union c, which is exactly what we wanted to show. And again, this is the first case when x is in a. We need to do the second case, that x is not an a. So we're going to start with x is not an a. And you know what I think is brilliant about this or and breaking it into cases? Is that you get to assume this extra piece of information. For one case, you get to assume that x is an a. And then you uh, do the next case where x is not an a. So it's like you get this information for free, almost out of nowhere. But it's because you're going to solve all the cases that are relevant, which is x is an a or x is not an a. Now I'm going to compare where I, I am at, which isn't very far, that x is not an a, with what I need to show. And so I need to show that x is in the intersection of a union b and a union c. In other words, x is an a union b and a union c. Well, x is not an a, so I'm going to have to somehow show that x is in b and x is in c in order to do this. And um, what else do I have? Well, I do have, I do have this hypothesis here, right? I have the fact that x is in a union b intersect c. So I'm going to bring this part of the hypothesis into play. So again, I'm going to look at my hypothesis, and I have that x is in a union b intersect c, but I also have here that x is not in a. So that must mean that x is in b union c, and I noted that. So it's because we have the hypothesis that x is in a, uh, x is in a union b intersect c, but x is not in a. So therefore, x must be in b union c. Sorry, I meant x is in b intersect c, which means x is in b and x is in c by definition of intersection. That should be an intersection. So um, I've kind of broken this down as much as I can, so I'm just going to look again at what it is I want to show. So I have x and b, I have x and c, so I just need to union it with a, but I can do that now. Since x is in b, x is in a union b, because to be in the union, you only have to be in one or the other. In this case, x is in b. And I can also say, since x is in c, that x is in the union of a and c. And now I have this case, if x is not an a, I still have that x is an a union b intersect c is contained in um, a, um, a union b intersect a union c. So I've done my two cases, and I've shown part one of my proof. Remember, there are two parts to my proof, and I've shown part one. So to prove the second part, we want to show that um, A union B intersect A union C is a subset of A union B intersect C. And then, like all of our uh, proofs for containment, to do this, we always start with let X be in the subset. And then we want to show, what we want to end with, is X is in the superset. So if X is in a union B intersect A union C, by definition of union, that means X is in A union B, I mean, by definition of intersection, sorry, X is in A union B and X is in A union C. 
if I want, I can break this down a little bit more. Um, actually, not really, because this isn't an intersection. So um, all I know is x is either an a or b, and here x is either an a or c. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare this to what it is that I want to show. I want to show that x is in the uh, union of a and b intersect c. So I'm a little bit stuck, but I can look at this a little closer, and I say that... Um, X, to be in the union, either needs to be an A or in B intersect C. So I look at this, I have X is an A, I have B and C here. So there's nothing immediate that comes to mind, but again, remember the union means X is an A or X is in B union C. So I can do that same trick where I can take these cases, I can use the OR, and make it into cases. In particular, the cases can be x is an a or x is not an a. And just uh, for completeness, I really could have done this other case that x is in b intersect c or x is not in b intersect c. So I'm either going to do this set of two cases or this set of two cases. But this is what I like about this trick so much. I feel like it's really brilliant when you can see this. Um, if you take these two cases, in case one, you've already done your proof because if x is an a, then x is an a union whatever. So you this is already proved for you. And then when you are working on the second part of um, this, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a minute. Also, similarly, if you had taken these two as your cases, um, for this first case, x is in b intersect c, you would have already proven this case. You want, would have already shown what you wanted to show. Here I've written out the first case. So if x is an a, then x is going to be a union any set here, but in particular b intersect c. So then I've shown what I wanted to show and um, the subset, the containment is proven. Now I need to do the case that x is not an a. And so with just x is not an a, I'm kind of a, uh, I don't have a lot of place to go, but I can use the fact that x is in a union b intersect a union c, which means that x is in a union b and x is in a union c. So now I'm getting somewhere. And this is very similar to uh, the previous example. x is in a union b, um, so it has to be that x is in b since x is not an a. Similarly, uh, we have x is in a union c, since x is not an a, that must mean x is in c. Well, if x is in b and x is in c, then x is in b intersect c, and so we have uh, proven what we wanted to show. x is in a union b intersect c, and therefore um, we have proven this containment, part two. And we also proved part one, so we're actually done with the proof. Our next definition is of an index set. And uh, the definition looks kind of complicated, but it's really not. So when you get a definition like this, just take it uh, step by step and see what we can do. Breaking this down a little bit, I see that um, we have a non-empty set J, and we have elements little j. So here I have my non-empty set J, one, two, three. I'm just kind of making a little example. And then I say there are corresponding sets A sub J. So here are my corresponding sets A sub one, that's j equals 1, my corresponding set a sub 2, that's j equals 2, and my corresponding set a sub 3, uh, which is j equals 3. And so remember, j is called an index set, which is basically because these elements in j just become indices to a1, a2, a3. And then I can say my set a is equal to the union of all my um, a sub j's. So. And just some other notes, if you un the union of all the a sub j's, well, that's all the uh, elements x, such that x is an element of one of the uh, a sub j's for some j. And the intersection is the same thing. It's x, such that x is an a sub j, except that it's now, instead of just for some j, it's for all j, which kind of makes sense. That's the intersection union. And if j equals 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 then the union of all the a sub j's is basically the union of all the individual sets. So here we have the union of a 
uh, 1, A2, A3. Again, it's called an index set. J is called an index set because these numbers or the elements of J are just used as an index into uh, different partitions or subsets of our big set A. And um, it's not a difficult definition, but you will see that a lot. So you kind of want to be comfortable with an index set. Okay, so for our first example of index sets, so for each k in the natural numbers n, let a sub k equal the set 0, uh, the, the, sorry, closed interval 0 to minus 1 over k. So then uh, the claim is the intersection, I'm sorry, the union from k equals 1 to infinity of a sub k is equal to 0 to 2. So let's see why that's the case. So first, our index set so is k and k are the natural numbers. So our index set is k equals 1, 2, and 3. a1 is equal to 0, 2 minus 1 over 1, which is 0 to 1. a2 is equal to the uh, closed interval 0, 2 minus 1 over 2, which is 0, 3 halves. a3 is 0, 2 minus 1 over 3, which is 0 and 1 and 2 thirds. So it's kind of getting bigger, 1 to 1 and a half to 1 and 2 thirds. So if we look at the nth term, we'll get 0, 2 minus 1 over n, and as n gets really large, uh, this fraction gets really small, so we're approaching 0 to 2, and so that is our answer here. Okay, our next example, let s be equal to x in the real number such that x is greater than 0. So for each x in s, a sub x is equal to minus 1 over x to 1 over x, and the claim is that the intersection of all the ax is equal to 0. So let's look and see what's happening. So S, um, it's all the real numbers, so I can't really list them. But I can take some examples, like a real number X that's greater than 0 is 1. So if I plug in A1, I'm going to get minus 1 over 1 to 1 over 1, which is the interval negative 1 to 1. If I plug in the real number 2, um, I'm going to get minus 1 half to 1 half. So, um, you can see that the intervals, well, I'll do one more, a10 is minus one-tenth to one-tenth. So you can see the intervals are centered at zero, and as you get bigger um, x's, they, the intervals get uh, smaller and smaller. So eventually, they're just going to close in on zero. The intersection is just going to be equal to zero. And again, they're real numbers, so you could have done something like a of 3.14, that would have been fine, and it would have been 1 over 3.14 to 1 over 3.14. So you could have done whatever real numbers you wanted. I chose um, easy integers so I could see what was happening. Our interval was getting smaller and smaller, closing in around zero. Doing a quick review of the first overview page, we did talk about sets and different definitions. We talked about subsets. Um, we had some examples. I didn't mention the empty set, so I'll do that now. The empty set, which is denoted with this null, is the set with no members. It is a subset of all the other sets. We talked about construction of new sets from old sets, the union, intersection, complement. We talked about Venn diagrams. Oh, I did not talk about what it means to be disjoint. Two sets are disjoint if their intersection is null. In other words, they do not have any elements in common. Okay, so we talked about Venn diagrams and properties of set operators. Looking at our second overview slide, I haven't talked about Venn diagrams, so we'll continue with that. A union B, if this blob, this circle represents A, the circle represents B, then A union B is everything in A or everything in B. So it sounds like everything in A and B put together. The intersection are elements that are both in A and also in B, so that's this little portion here. And A relative complement of B, that's everything in A that is not in B, so that's represented here. We also have these properties, this theorem here, which might be useful to you, I don't use them a lot, and we already talked about index sets, so I believe we are done with our topic, so next we'll have some review problems. Here are six review problems for you to do. Pause the video, give them a try, and then on the next slide, I'll have some solutions. These are the solutions for problem number one and two. Here is the solution for the proof. 
For this problem, in both cases, this top one and also the second case, I started with the picture to kind of assure myself which one I should do a counterexample for and which one I should actually try to prove. This one here, when I drew the picture, you can see in yellow I had the A complement B, and then I did A complement A complement B. So that's everything in A that's not in A complement B. So it's this green section here. Why I, I graphed this over on this side, and it ended up being the same section. So then I went ahead and did the proof. It's fairly straightforward. This one here, I did B complement A, that's in yellow. Then I did A complement of what's in B complement A. That is everything in A that is not in B complement A. So that's this green section. Similarly here, I have A complement B in green, and then B complement A complement A. That's everything in B that is not in A complement B. And I can see this, the yellow portion is not equal to my green portion. So I, to do a counterexample, what I did is I put in a representative elements 1, 2, and 3. And I needed 3 because I needed an element that was in A, an element in the intersection, and an element in B. And then from there, I constructed A is equal to 1, 2, B is equal to 2, 3, and you can see that I have a proper counterexample. Here is my proof for number 5, and I do have one note for you. When you have X is not in B union C, that's the negation of X is in B union C. X in B union C means that X is in B or X is in C by definition of union. So when you negate that, you have that X is not in B and X is not in C. But when you negate an or, you have to flip the or to an and. So you have to remember how to do this negation here. Everything else, I believe, is fairly straightforward. This last one has to do with index sets, which, as I said, looks complicated, but it's really not. So um, here... I, uh, since I'm trying to prove equality, I have two things to prove. I have to prove that the uh, left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side. That's part one. And part two is that the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side, which is part two. And I did do some drawings just so I could get a feel for what's going on. And here, uh, your index set J is um, just... J can range from one to whatever, infinity or something. But I just did a drawing with J ranging from 1 to 2 because I can draw that. So I have B and my, I have my set A1 and my set A2. I will outline how I did part 1 and I'll let you read part 2 on your own. So X is in B complement the intersection of the A sub J. That means X is in B and X is not in the intersection of the A sub J. This part, X is not in X sub J, that's like the negation of, or that is the negation of X is in A1 and, because it's the intersection, x is in a2, and up to x is in an. So the negation of this, so we have the x is not in a1, not in a2, not in an, but to negate the ands, the ands now have to become ors. Since we know that x is in b, then x is in b, and x is not in a1, that means x is in b relative complement of a1. And we also know that x is in B and x is not in A2. That means x is in B relative complement A2, all the way down to An. So that must mean x is in the union of B relative complement of A sub J. And I seem to have prepared this extra problem somewhere along the line so you can take a look at it as well. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.